Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. You are the fairest of 10,000. You are altogether lovely, Jesus. You are our sweet master, our Lord, our Savior, our God, our best friend, our Redeemer. Lord, I ask you that you would draw nigh to us today, Father. For it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus, coming and touching our hearts, taking hot coals of fire off your altar and placing it upon our hearts. Our hearts are burning from within at the sound of your voice, O oh God. So come and speak, Lord. Bring unction, Father. I ask you that you'd speak a present word in this place today. Father, that it would not be about a man or a personality, but that you would speak. Abba, Father, speak forth. Cry out today, Lord. Make us a voice of one crying in Long Island today. That we would lose our voice and we become the voice of another. The voice of one crying. The voice of one shouting. The voice of one proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. Father, we ask you that your depth would come forth in Jesus' name. That your revelatory anointing would come forth. That your prophetic anointing would come forth, Father. Lord, I don't want to open an encyclopedia over people's minds today, Lord, but I want the heavens to open, Jesus. The heavens to open. So, Lord, would you open the heavens? Would you open the heavens? Would you open the heavens, Lord, that we may see you, that we may receive an impartation, of spirit and life that we may leave this place changed and transformed and transfigured lord father i pray father that you would burn to this place bring your burning bush into this basement i pray your manifest presence your manifest glory father i ask that you would quicken us quicken us lord and stir us father Oh, Father, that we, that we may receive that spirit and life impartation. In Jesus' precious name, take that hot coal of fire and place it upon my lips. I'm dependent upon you, Jesus. I can do nothing outside of you. So, Lord, I'm leaning. Your son is leaning upon you, Father. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you would take full control of my mouth and speak forth your message. And Lord, that you would hide me behind your cross, that you would receive the glory and the honor. We love you so much, Jesus. We thank you for everything you'll do today. At the one o'clock and at the seven o'clock tonight. And I have this, this sense that you've saved the best for last, that tonight, Father, that you are going to tremendously move by your spirit on our hearts and our lives. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want to make sure that before we leave tonight that you lay your hands and you pray for us. Because we would value, we would value that those prayers... Because as we go home, we're waiting to close on that building. Yes, and we are very excited about Oasis Bible Training Center being birthed in the Finger Lake region. There's a bridal movement that's stirring in the Finger Lakes. And we, we want to see that Bible training school just touch a multitude of people. And again, we 
roll out the red carpet for all of you to come to any of the conferences. We'll be scheduling many conferences a year. We want you to come and just turn aside with us and meet the Lord. Amen. The Lord loves to turn aside and go to places where he's wanted. And we appreciate him and we want him. And we also want you. We want you, our friends. So we want a Long Island bus. Huge bus. Steve's going to drive the bus. <laughs> All the way to the Finger Lakes. Hallelujah. And the Rochester area as we dig up wells of Charles Finney and Daniel Nash too. Hallelujah. So pray for us tonight. Amen. 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 Well, we've been in the garden this week. Yeah. We've been in the garden. And I just began to pray about that. And I said, Lord, how am I ever going to fill four messages with the garden? And, and now it's like, I think I have about eight to 12 messages. We've just touched the surface. And without even trying, it's already becoming a book. And uh, so when that book comes out on the on Eden and the secrets of Eden, I want you to know it, it was sparked out of these meetings in Long Island. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Thank you Jesus. But we're going to touch on a couple things today. And we're going to see what the Lord has to say. We're going to talk about trees. And we're going to talk about birds. Amen. Hallelujah. Just like in your garden. That's right. You'll find more about that soon. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Look at verse number 9. Thank you, Jesus. Verse number 9, it says, And the Lord God planted all sorts of trees in the garden, beautiful trees that produced delicious fruit, at the center of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As I was praying, the Lord brought me into the garden. I've been sharing about what I saw in the garden. It was like the Lord, I sensed like I was in the garden of Eden. And I could see the joy on the face of the Father as he began to create. He spoke forth the creative word and it happened. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be trees, and there was trees. As he spoke forth the trees, it just happened. If you could see the Father, you would see that his hands were moving. I could see the Father as I was praying, and it was like the, the choirs of heaven were singing. It was like an orchestra and he was like directing, it was just like speaking forth the creative word and being directed. Hallelujah. Like a conductor. And as he conducted, life burst forth at his spoken word. Isn't that powerful? That we serve a father that has creative power with his tongue? That he can dream things up and it will happen. And so he created the beautiful trees. I've always had a love for the trees. And I love to go into the forest. I can remember as a Bible school, I just got out of Pinecrest and I got back home and I, I can remember going into the woods. And as I went into the woods, it wasn't a big giant forest, but it was a, a woods at least. And I went back where nobody was and I just waited on the Lord. And I, and I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm not going to leave this woods until I know I had an encounter with you. And I would wait back there and wait and wait and wait. And I could remember the Holy Spirit coming in the woods amongst the trees and filling me and refilling me with the Holy Spirit. There's something special about just walking with the Lord in the woods. There's something special about walking into the gardens. It seems like we're walking with Jesus. And you know what? I believe that we are. Amen. That he's personally walking with his bride. And we walk with him through the woods. And we look into his eyes and his eyes that blaze like fire. Look in our direction. And we can receive powerful revelation from the trees 
and the birds and everything that he has created. You notice when Jesus taught, he used loaves and fishes. He used just everyday things. And he brought forth profound truth from the simplest of things. When he talked about fishes, he talked about being fishers of men. He would talk about being farmers and planting fields and plowing ground and planting seeds. And he would bring powerful principles. Principles that would come out, revelatory truth. In the day and age where sometimes we take complicated things and make them even more complicated, Jesus took complicated revelation and he made it simple so people could understand. So I was asking the Lord, Lord, would you not speak to me about your creation? Is there any spiritual principles? Is there any lessons that I can learn? Can you teach me something from the, the trees and the birds? And so we began to look through this chapter, and I noticed something. The Lord God planted all sorts of trees in the garden, beautiful trees that produced delicious fruit. And I said, Lord, would you not plant me in your garden? Then I may produce fruit that remains. Can I not be a tree in your garden? The wonderful thing about these trees is that it was watered from the rivers of living water. And those waters gave life to the roots of the tree. And I said, Lord, could I not be your beautiful bride and be planted like a tree in your garden? Could you not make me a mighty oak tree of righteousness? That I would stand firm in this day and age when the winds are blowing and the storms are coming. Lord, may I be an oak tree of righteousness when the contrary winds come. Could I not be an oak tree of righteousness. When others around me decide that they're not going to follow hard after God, can I be an oak tree of righteousness? Can I put my roots deep into the soil and receive the nutrition? Lord, make us firm and strong. For the enemy in the end times is trying his very best to bring winds that blow really hard and it's harder than ever before in history of mankind to run hard after God. But in the midst of the chaos, the Lord is speaking a word. Let there be trees. In the midst of the disaster that mankind has created, the Lord is speaking forth a word. Let there be trees. Let there be oak trees of righteousness that places their roots firm into the soil. When the winds blow, they will not be shaken. When the winds are contrary, they will not fall apart. They will stand strong and be an example of a sturdy, strong, mature bride. So the Lord will have a tree in his garden. And she will not be shaken, brother. She will not be shaken. No matter what happens, she will not be shaken. Why? Because she's planted in the Lord's garden. Amen. Hallelujah. She's not planted in the desert. She's not planted in the sand. She's not planted in the wasteland. She's planted in the garden of the Lord. She's planted in the garden. And because she's planted in the garden, she will remain firm and sturdy and strong. You see, I see the body of Christ and I see Christ's bride and I see that she has a love in her heart for the bridegroom. 
But I also see at the same time that because we're in the end times, it's getting tougher and tougher. And I see the winds, the contrary winds blowing. And some in the body of Christ are being shaken by the wind. I want to remind you today that you are planted in Christ's garden. And if you're in Christ's garden, if you're planted in Eden, that means the Lord's going to tend to you. He's going to take care of his garden. He's going to take care of his trees of righteousness. He's going to take care of his trees because his trees are receiving his protection. And no matter what wind blows your way and no matter what happens, I want you to know you are the Lord's responsibility. You are his bride. Can a bridegroom neglect his bride? Can a bridegroom turn his head when his bride is in need? I want you to know that the bridegroom is only a whisper away. No matter what you're going through, he's a whisper away. I remember, I don't know, I think I was with Diane that trip, but we were flying to South Africa. It was like a 17 hour flight, long flight from Atlanta, Georgia to Johannesburg, and we were about halfway there. And what you need to know about when you're halfway there, that means you're over the ocean. There's nowhere to land. So if there's an emergency, you just got to ride it out. And so we were up there, and we hit some, some of the most awful turbulence that I have ever, and I have flown all over the place. It was one of, it still to this day was the worst flight I've ever been on. It was like literally the, the plane... It felt like it was coming down. Even sinners were praying. <laughs> they were doing Hail Marys and, you know, different stuff. And, you know, we were all like, okay. But I went to the Lord. This little tree went to the Lord, to the master gardener, and said, Daddy, Daddy, your little boy is a little shaken. Literally, yeah. shaken in a tube in the middle of the ocean. But would you protect me? Would you not make sure that I reach safety? And all of a sudden, this peace came over me. This peace that passes understanding. That means when it doesn't make sense, you have the understanding. And I had a revelation. I had the understanding. I was downloaded with the revelation that I would not only reach safety, but that I would thrive. So when everyone else was in chaos, I was in peace. Because my daddy, God, let me know that he was taking good care of me. My father made sure that his son would reach maturity. That I still had a work to do. That there was words that had not come to pass. So even when you find yourself in a life-threatening situation, remember, you're an oak tree of righteousness in the garden. Amen. And your life is going to produce fruit and fruit that remains. The fruit is the promises of God, the fulfillment of the call and the destiny and the purposes of the Lord. Fruit that remains. For He has already watered you. And he's already tended you and he's pruned you and he's taken great care of you. Will he neglect you now? No. He will take care of you. Do not be shaken. I keep on feeling that. Do not be shaken. Put your foot down and say, I'm in the master's garden. I'm going to be a tree. Hallelujah. And I'm going to produce fruit. I like how this translation says delicious fruit. Lord, would you make me delicious fruit? Amen. I don't want to be an old banana that's going black, you know, on the edges. I want to be a delicious fruit. Lord, would you not make your bride a delicious fruit? That we would be pleasing in your sight. That we would bring forth seeds that would mass produce that which you have placed within us. Lord, I don't want to be an old apple, but Father, would I not be a, a delicious apple for you, Jesus? I know that's very simple, but I'm a simple guy. And to me, it makes sense that the Lord just wants us to be delicious. 
Walter Butler had a, a word, you know, Walter Butler had special words that he liked to use. He made up his own dictionary and he called it Butlerisms. And one of his Butlerisms was deliciousness. Deliciousness. And he talked about, he used the word delicious and he put deliciousness on the end of it. And that would describe something that was just tremendous. Could we not be deliciousness to the Lord? Hallelujah. Could we not? Hallelujah. Could we not be that pleasing? Okay. At the center of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So here we see the tree of life. This was a very special tree. This was a tree that Adam and Eve could eat from. The Lord said to eat from this tree. And when Adam and Eve would eat from the tree, literally they were eating from the substance of God. It caused them to live eternally. That's why when they sinned, there was angels that were placed around that tree and they no longer could go and eat. That's why the devil was tricking them and telling them, you know, you don't need to just eat from that tree. Go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What I want you to know in life, there's always two trees. There's always two trees. There's God's way and there's our way. And sometimes we make ourselves think that this is the right way when it's really that way. And there's always a tree of life that we can lean on. And I asked the Lord this question. I said, Lord, could I not be a tree of life? A tree of life? The tree of life had its roots far into the ground and would bring forth the water. And it made it strong. And it brought everlasting life. The tree had substance. The tree had life to it. And the Lord began to show me that we're all called to be trees of life. What do I mean by that? How are we called to be a tree of life? We are called to be trees of life that we would impart spirit and life everywhere we go. Rather than impart the knowledge of good and evil, that's a Babylonian message. It's a message of, of the intellect. God wants there to be a bride that's operating in the spirit. And the Lord says, I will cause her roots to be in the waters and she will be a tree of life. A tree of life. And she will impart spirit in life. You see, you can't impart that which you do not have. So if you want to be a tree of life and you want to impart spirit and life, you must first go to the source. Your roots must be in the right place. In Psalms chapter 1, you probably know where I'm going. Verse number 3, they are like trees planting along the river bank, bearing fruit each season without fail. The leaves neither wither, and all they do, they prosper. They will be like trees planted along the river bank. That's us, trees of life, planted along the river bank. What's the river? The river of life, the river that ran through Eden, the river that's before the throne room of God, and our roots are in the river, the holy river of God. Therefore, because we're drinking the right water, we're producing life and life more abundantly. And therefore, now God is saying, the water that you've received, I want you to go and impart that water. Impart that spirit and life to those that desperately need a touch. See, so many people feel that unless you're preaching in front of a multitude of people that you can't impart spirit and life or that you have to be a part of the five-fold ministry in order to impart spirit and life. I want you to know, you as his bride, you are called Amen. to impart spirit and life. You are called to be a tree of life everywhere you go. And the Lord is looking for someone that will go impart spirit and life into someone else. Look for two or three people that you can impart spirit and life into. 
Do not impart the spirit of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't impart your words. But ask the Lord as you're waiting on him, as you're soaking and saturating yourself in the very presence of the Lord, as you're drinking from the deep wells, Lord, would you not speak to my heart? Would you not give me a word, a present word, a word of substance, a word of healing, a creative word, that I may take that word and give it to someone else? Amen. Impartation is so powerful. Paul imparted into Timothy. Moses definitely passed it down to Joshua. There was an impartation, a mantle that fell. And God wants you to impart. You may not think that you're spiritual enough or that you're, you're a great stature enough or that you're not high enough on the totem pole. The Lord is looking to your heart. If you'll just get quiet and wait on the Lord, the Lord will bring you one or two or even three people that you can impart. Maybe it's someone at work that you can impart words of life. And you know what? Their heads are going to snap back because you're going to carry the wisdom of God. You're going to, you're going to carry the kingdom keys that will set them free. Suddenly, you're going to have wisdom. You, you're just going to open your mouth. You're not even going to know what you're saying. You know what? You're not saying it. The Lord's saying it through you. He's going to take over your mouth. He's looking for a vessel that will open their mouth and speak. That will take the Lord at His word. And the Lord says, I will use your mouth. And I'll impart spirit and life. And something will shift inside of that person. The most wonderful thing that I loved about listening to Brother Taylor was I could literally feel the impartation of the Holy Spirit. It was there was a spiritual substance that went inside of me. It was a creative word. It was different than saying, oh, that was a great message, Pastor. I'm not talking about uh, just a good message. I'm talking about there was, a, there was something deeper going on. You could feel it, that transfer, that, that impartation. You know what that was? Way Taylor knew how to wait on the Lord. He knew how to go in and sit on a stool and lift up his hands and close his eyes and wait on the Lord. Therefore, the Lord gave him water. His roots were planted, and he became a tree of life. Well, all of us as sons and daughters of the Lord, and some of us as sons and daughters of Brother Taylor, we should also be trees of life and never underestimate that which God has given us. Even if you make a difference in one person's life, you've made a difference. What we're praying about with this Bible school that we're starting, that it would be a school of impartation. A school of impartation. People, students would leave with a burning impartation on the inside of them. Yes, they would get taught. Yes, they would study to show themselves approved. Of course. But at the same time, more than anything else, they would leave with an active, living relationship with Jesus and love with the bridegroom. Because I'm telling you, when you're in love with the bridegroom, it's contagious. And you'll splash that water wherever that you go. Wherever you go, people will say there's something, there's something different. There's a scripture verse that says, one amongst a thousand. A, a messenger, one amongst a thousand. Line up a thousand people, and there's one out of a thousand that's a messenger. They're carrying a word. They're carrying spiritual substance. They're being downloaded by the Holy Spirit. Their roots are firmly planted in the river. And they're being downloaded with spirit and life. And now when they speak, they don't speak their own sense or their own intellect, their own wisdom, their own mind. In fact, the, the very opposite happens. They lose their voice and they become the voice of another. The voice of one crying. May we all lose our voice. The natural voice of Steve Porter and, and what I think and what I, it doesn't matter. I tell you, you would think after I started speaking in 1990, you'd think after all these years that I would lose my nervousness of speaking. 
But I know that unless the Lord takes over my mouth, that it's just Steve Porter standing. And so I'm always dependent on the Lord saying, Lord, would you not take over that session? And it's been thousands, probably tens of thousands now of messages given. But I know that if it's just Steve standing up here, I just want to turn the microphone off and go home. I know it's not me. But man, if we can just close our eyes and submit and yield our being, the totality of our beings over to the Lord, the Lord will then, oh, He'll speak forth a message and it will shake nations. And the overcomers will speak forth a message in the end times and it will shake nations. And they'll speak forth the creative word. And as they speak, it will happen. For even the atmospheres will change. And the skies will become bright with the glory of God. And awareness of the King of kings and the Lord of lords will come. The overcomers are coming, says the Lord. The overcomers are coming. Standing strong, trees of life, oak trees of righteousness, firmly rooted and grounded in me. And will not I make them, will not I make them a watering source to those that are weary? Will I not cause spirit and life and impartation to flow even in these end times? Have I not saved even the best for last? Jesus, hallelujah. I see the overcomers. They're standing strong and they're speaking forth the word in season to him that's weary and heavy laden. And they're imparting spirit and life. There's creative words coming from their lips. And they're not paying attention to CNN or Fox News. They're paying attention to what Jesus has to say. And they're not receiving what everybody else thinks about their region and their area. Oh, there's people that said about New York, it's too cold. People, people are too cold and it's too cold. I believe there's wells in New York State, upstate and downstate, that we are to dig up. And we should receive the word of the Lord for our state. I will not give up on New York State. There's open heaven in New York State. We need to contend for it. Yes. We need to ask for it. Right. We need to lean on Jesus yes. and fast and pray yes. in earnest that God would once again move by His Spirit. Yes. That an awareness of the very presence of God. I could remember so many times over the years I would just approach the campus of Pinecrest and as I did, as I was on the long pine little road leading to the the, the main buildings, I would be overcome with the manifest yes, presence of yes, God. Yes. Wow. Why? Because there was such a presence there. Wow. I can't go too much further because I'm almost starting to preach tonight's message. Oh, Jesus, help me. Put me back on track. Amen. So we got to contend for that. And trust the Lord. Hallelujah. That what he did once, he'll do it again. That you're called to impart spirit and life. The people are weary and they need to hear words of life. They're tired of dry, dead, boring, intellectual sermons. They're tired of three points in a poem. They want words of life. They want impartation. They need something more than what man's ability has to offer. They need the river of life flowing through. Will he not have a bride? Will he not have a pure river in these end times? Will he not have a tree of righteousness? Will he not have a tree once again with its roots firmly planted? Do you want to produce spirit and life? Well, then begin to saturate and soak and wait on the Lord. I like to use the phrase, behold the Lord. I once gave a message on the word behold. 
behold is more than just attention. Some translations say that word means just attention. But behold, the Lord is take him all in. It's not just grabbing a hold of your attention. If you behold, if I'm beholding Steve, I'm taking him all in, and the Lord will have a bride that will behold him, will take him all in, and be consumed by his manifest presence. And they will become a burning bush in a dry wasteland. They'll become a burning bush of his manifest presence. They'll be like John the Baptist. They'll become that voice of one crying. That voice of one crying. People want to hear the voice of one crying. They want to hear a singular voice that comes from the heart of God. They're tired of man's agenda and man's stuff. Oh, I don't want that. I've been spoiled by the real thing. The Lord wants to download us with a present word. A present word, words of life, substance, that when we speak, people will begin to behold the Lord. When you speak, the atmosphere changes. When you speak, the presence of God invades the darkness of their hearts and lives. You can walk into a coffee shop, and the Lord all of a sudden causes you to run into someone, and you can begin to impart spirit and life, and they're not going to know what hit them. Casual Christians, spectators of the inner court, the daughters of Jerusalem, or sinners that don't even know, have a, don't have a clue or an awareness. When they hear rivers of living water, when they hear that water spout of glory, they will be so... I have no words to describe it. They will know that they're in the audience of the Lord and not a mere man or a mere woman yes. will not his bride carry the atmosphere of heaven in the end times yes. will not his bride shine beautifully will she not carry the shekinah glory of the lord and be clothed with his beauty oh jesus thank you lord jesus thank you jesus thank you lord Hallelujah. Back into the garden. We're back in Eden now. What time is it? We're okay. Three o'clock. Hallelujah. Are you in a hurry? No. I still feel strength. I was a little tired before we got started, but I feel some strength now. So I want to strike where the iron's hot and keep on going for a little bit. Okay? We'll go tonight too. Hallelujah. I'm not in a hurry. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 20 and 22. Thank you, Jesus. Then God said, Let the waters be filled with many living things, and let there be birds to fly in the air over the earth. So God created the large sea animals. He created all the many living things in the sea and every kind of bird that flies in the air. Every kind of bird that flies in the air. And God saw that it was good. So I want you to see Father. There he is. He's standing in Eden. And he says, let there be every kind of bird. And at the speed of thought... As he spoke, the power of God began to create every kind of species of birds. Now, I think this is profound. Now, I can't prove this biblically, but this is just a hunch I have. I believe that when we get to heaven, that the Lord is going to show us reruns of certain things that happen on the earth. But it's not going to be like watching a little black and white TV or even a big screen. It's going to be in true living color. We're going to stand there and we're going to see creation. I can't prove that. I'm not saying that. It's just something that I, 
a, a little knowing that I have inside of my heart. I believe we're going to stand there and we're going to see creation. Can you imagine standing there in Eden as the Lord says, I'm going to create not one bird, but every kind of bird that there is. Do you realize how intricate? I could give you a full message just on that thought right there. How intricate, how detailed. He created every bird, every color, every trait of every bird. And he did it with a spoken word. Again, I believe the heavenly choir was singing. When I was praying, I felt like I was in Eden and I could see the Father. And I saw him just moving his hand. As he moved his hand to that sound of heaven, things began to be created and happen. And all of the birds of the world, every single bird that was ever created, God burst them onto the scene. And all these birds came. So I think, this is just me now, I think that if God took so much care of creating the birds, I want to be interested in them too. That the birds of the air are not here by accident. That they're here by divine appointment. That God brought them here. And I think that the birds can actually teach us parables or lessons that, that God can give us revelation from everything. If you ask God to teach you something, he can teach you. Once I asked the Lord, Lord, would you teach me about the hummingbird? I always had an interest in hummingbirds. I, I've tried for years to attract hummingbirds to my house. It's very difficult. But when they come, I watch them very closely. I have a book of hummingbirds. My grandmother actually gave me a book when I was just a small little boy on birds. And ever since then, I've had this interest. If you were to come to my yard, like my sister has, you would see birdhouses all in the trees. And you'd see bird feeders everywhere. Squirrel-proof bird feeders. Because I've lost hundreds of dollars in bird seed to squirrels. There's a message in there somewhere. Hallelujah. <laughs> and there's a, a bird bath that we have. And I love to watch the birds. And what, I'll, what I love to do is I have these bird feeders that are right outside our front door. And we have windows in our front door. So often I will go and I'll peek out there and I'll see the birds. I realize that there's prophetic revelation everywhere that God can use anything as an illustration to, to teach us something if we're open the Lord will teach us. He'll, he'll download us with revelation. So I asked the Lord a couple years ago about hummingbirds. And he spoke to me about the hummingbird. And I wrote, a, a, we call it the spiritual maturity tracks. But I wrote a track. A, it's a pamphlet on hummingbirds. Hallelujah. But today, I want to talk about one other bird that I've been asking the Lord about for some time. I don't know why, but I've taken such an interest in blue jays and cardinals. Blue jays and cardinals. I'm going to give a message on cardinals another time. I'm not going to do that today because that's a full message. But I just want to say this. About a year ago, I was watching the cardinals in my yard. And I said, Lord, now this is like a bride that's speaking to the bridegroom, asking for some special attention. So this is the, that, that was my heart in this. I said, I said, Lord, could we not have something special between us? Would you not bring cardinals and blue jays into my yard? Because I saw them only once in a while, and I love to watch them. I said, Lord, would you not bring the cardinals and the blue jays? And every time that I see a cardinal from this day on, or a bluebird, that means that you're thinking about me, that I'm on your heart, and that you're sending me your special love. Now, that may be foolish to some people, but, but that's just something between me and the Lord that I did. And you know what? Everywhere I looked, I began seeing cardinals 
and Blue Jays. I was amazed. And not only did I see real Blue Jays, but I started seeing paintings of Cardinals. <laughs> now, this is very special. I just want to share this. And it doesn't really have anything to do with the message, but it, it's a part of it. So we're family here, so we're just going to talk in a friendly way. I'm not here to impress. We're just going to talk in a friendly way. But, you, you know, I mentioned it last night that my dear mother passed away when she... Uh, on uh, the 18th of February, and it was the most difficult season of my entire life because my mom was uh, just so inspirational. She was a praying mother that got on her knees and prayed and sought God for me. When I got off track in my earlier years, she prayed me back on track. I couldn't get away with anything. Whenever I did anything wrong, she knew. And she wasn't afraid to lovingly confront me and put me back on track. And if she saw anything in a very loving way like a mom can do, she would very gently help me to see things the right way. And I believe that I am what I am today because of a praying mother that really, really earnestly loved me. When I had no self-esteem, see, I went to Pinecrest at 19 years old and I had no self-esteem because I was the least chosen for everything. I still remember my high school teacher. He said in front of the entire class, I know who's going to be the most likely to succeed in this class and who's going to be the least likely to succeed. And when he said least likely, he looked right at me. I was the most least likely to succeed in my class. Nobody had any hope that I would ever do anything. And my mother was the first person who spoke spirit and life and destiny. When I told her that I was stupid and that I could not learn, she said, Steve, you are more than enough through Christ Jesus. Yes. You can do all things yes. through Christ who gives you strength. You're yes. called to be a spokesman. You're called to be a minister of the gospel. God's going to say, and she would just speak words of life. The second person that spoke words of life over me as a little 19-year-old boy was Wade Taylor. I went into his office. I had zero confidence. I had no hope. I didn't go to Pinecrest to be a minister. In fact, I thought... My mom kind of tricked me. She said, just go and pray. And I said, okay, I'll go and pray. And then I started waiting because I had this interest. And I started waiting at Wade Taylor's door, his office. And I would wait for a half hour to an hour to get in because there was always a line after dinner. And I would go in. He had this special spot. And I'd go to this special spot. And he would take my hands. And he said, Lord, I impart spirit and life, the gift to speak from his heart, and the gift to write books. And literally, I would feel the fire of God go through my hands and fire into my chest. I could feel the coals of fire of impartation. Now, you're talking about the kid that was least likely to succeed, one that went to Pinecrest with no self-esteem, that had no aspirations to ever be used of God, the thought that he couldn't. Because when I did try to speak, even though my father's a... Uh, pastor and I have three generations of ministers I fell flat on my face so I knew that I couldn't do it but Wade spoke words of life into me and my mother spoke words of life into me and those words of life made such a difference made such a difference. can I encourage you to speak words of life over your children to speak creative words to impart spirit and life to them. Yes. To refuse to believe what the popular opinion is. I believe that God chooses unqualified people like me so that it would bring forth the most glory of God right. when he Amen. uses them. Right. Amen. Yes. Amen. God loves to, to go to the hopeless ones, the yeah. ones that you think that, oh man, it's going to be really difficult to ever see change with them. God loves to go to them and speak words of life over them. And so back to the story of my mom. So my mom passes away. It was very, very difficult. And I don't know why. I, I never noticed um, my mom's Facebook had her. I never noticed it. But as soon as she passed away, I looked at it and it was a cardinal. And then, and then, more precious than that, we had a, a time for just our family. We're actually having a big memorial for her in June. 
but uh, it happened in the dead of winter. It was a blizzard and it was difficult. So we just had just a private thing with immediate family. And my sister and I were there and our kids were there and our family members and things. And we were there. We were saying goodbye to my mother's earthly body because we knew that she was dancing in heaven. But I was heartbroken because I knew that my, you know, this, it, it was a closing of a chapter. Yes. And my sister and I went home. And uh, we went into the house, at her house, we were with my dad. And I looked out into the backyard and there was at least 30 to 50 red cardinals. Oh all together in the backyard. I have never seen that many cardinals. Always, right now at our, our bird box, we'll get a one cardinal or two cardinals once in a blue moon. There was a flock of red cardinals that were in that yard. And that was the Lord taking his son's broken heart and saying, son, I'm watching you. I'm giving you my individual special attention. Hallelujah. I'm thinking about you and I love you through this pain. And the Lord said to me, Steve, I'm going to take this pain that you feel and I'm going to use it for my glory. And he imparted something to me through the passing of my mother. And I shared it with Irene today. I have a determination on the inside of me. I have a new fire on the inside of me that I'm going to run my race and I'm going to run it well. I'm not going to talk about doing ministry. I'm going to flow in what God has called me to do. I'm not going to offer the Lord excuses. I'm going to run, 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 forest, run all the way into the gates of heaven. Because I know that amongst the great cloud of witnesses, there is my mother, Elizabeth Porter, that's standing there. And she's clapping for me. And she's proud of me. And she's saying, son, run. Run. Tell the bride. Prepare the bride. Prepare the bride. Prepare the bride. And I know that I must prepare the bride. That's my cause, to prepare the bride. It's in me. I didn't ask for it. I didn't look for it. Didn't ever think God would use me, but here I am. God is so wonderful and so beautiful. So God imparted something to me. And now I have an anticipation of seeing my mother again. But I want to see my mother when I finished my race. Yes. There's a people that need to be prepared for God's end time kingdom purposes. Have you heard that before? There's a people that God wants to prepare to hear the voice of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So God created the birds, and they burst forth. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Hallelujah. Cre creation declares the glory of God. And the work of his hands. Everything is here by special divine assignment. We can learn something from the birds. So I, I began to ask the Lord, Lord, teach me something about the blue jays and the cardinals. And I thought I was only going to get a little bit of information. The Lord gave me a lot. And, and now I know that I have to give more than one message on the, the blue jay and the cardinal. Because when the Lord downloads you, he gives you more than enough. Your cup runneth over. And I begin to apply some of the principles that God taught me about the Blue Jays to my bridal walk with God. And so I just want to teach you some of those things today. And I actually, we wrote an article. We always release an article of the month. And my article of the month is actually right here in front of me. I'm using it kind of as notes. But spiritual growth and lessons from the Blue Jay. So I'd encourage you, if you want more information about what I'm talking about today, because I can only give you just a little bit, I want you to grab a hold of that off of our website, and you can read it and pass it on to others. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 8, verse 22, it says, For we know that all creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. Creation is groaning. It's shouting, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Occupy until I come. Occupy until I come. 
Hallelujah. That's the message of creation. If you were to go into the woods and you were to get real quiet, you'd see the trees lifting their hands, their branches, and worshiping the Lord. You would hear the birds chirping and worshiping Jesus. If we could talk bird talk, we'd hear the robins, the canaries, and all the beautiful birds, the sparrows. You would hear them worshiping the Lord. Can you hear creation groan for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that he is coming soon? Jesus is coming soon. Creation is a reflection of his nature. Hallelujah. And they're here, not by accident. Have you ever thought about this too? Did you know that there are trees in heaven? There are birds in heaven? If earth is so beautiful in some places, can you imagine heaven? Can you imagine my dear mother opening her eyes in a twinkling of an eye? She was in heaven, surrounded by her family, smelling the perfume of his presence. Seeing the birds. I, I have such an interest and love for the birds. I told Diane the other day, I said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to reach up my arm like that and the birds aren't going to be afraid of me. They're going to come right down into my hands. And you know what they're going to say? Jesus is Lord. He is risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you, Jesus. So blue jays, they're a highly intelligent bird. They're resourceful. They know how to solve problems. They gather foods. They have... They're excellent communicators. They're known as the alarm of the forest. They know how to store food. So I asked the Lord for a revelation about these noisy blue jays. I said, is there anything that you can learn from the blue jay? I know they're pretty, but they're loud. They squawk. They actually know how to imitate hawks. And uh, they can be a little feisty at times. And I said, Lord, is there anything I can learn from the blue jay? And he began to highlight some qualities about them. Number one, the blue jays are brave, aggressive, and fearless. They're brave, aggressive, and fearless. Blue jays, this bird can cause turmoil because they are so loud and so boisterous. They are fearless and will attack their enemies when they see a perceived threat. They're not afraid to take on birds that are bigger. They actually do combat strategies like dive bomb. Most birds will not do that, but this bird dive bombs. Isn't that interesting? This bird's not afraid to fight. It refuses to retreat, and it has determination. And I began to ask the Lord about it, and he gave me this word. He said, the bluebirds are symbolic of my warrior bride. How so? They are warriors of God. The Lord is raising up a warrior bride who will not be intimidated by the enemy of their souls. She is brave and mighty and fierce in battle. This bride is both a lover and a warrior. She wears combat boots and is prepared to defend the truth. Satan and his cohorts are preparing for battle, but his bride is ready for it and she will not retreat the bride loves to lay her head on the chest of the sweet master but she will also wreak havoc grand havoc on the enemy's kingdom her arms are trained for battle and with the sword of her spirit she will dive bomb the enemy's camp hallelujah hallelujah by the word of her testimony and the blood of the lamb her testimony is like a trumpet that will intimidate and terrorize the enemy's camp. Hell's walls are coming down, blasted by the sounds of heaven. To God, this sound is beautiful and pure. To the enemy, it's terrifying and devastating. God is raising up a warrior bride. I love to talk about the sweetness of the bride and the beauty of the bride. But another element of the bride is she's a warrior. And we're living in the end times. And she's not kissing the enemy. She has the sword of the spirit. And the shield of faith. 
And she's speaking forth words that have consequence. Authority that's been given to her because she has right relationship with the Lord. And through that relationship, being in harmony, being the wheel within the wheel, she is speaking forth a, a creative, devastating word to enemy's kingdom. From this basement, if you will join hands and begin to pray, you can pray down strongholds. And you can make a difference. And God will then infuse you with his power. And as the warrior bride, you will go straight into the enemy's camp, right where the witches are, right where those that don't know Jesus, and you will speak forth a word of truth, and they will be terrified because they are in the audience with Jesus himself. Jesus has come. You're planted in his garden, and the gardener's coming right now, and he's standing beside his warrior bride. And when she speaks, he speaks because she's in unity with him. That's the wheel within the wheel. It's, it's, that, it's that special unity and harmony where we're one with the Lord because we've been with him so much and so long that when we speak, all heaven takes notice. The Lord will have a warrior bride and she will be brave, she'll be aggressive, and she'll be fearless. The Lord will not have a wimpy bride. We are coming into the days of the new world order. We're coming into the days when we're going to see devastation, where we're going to see literally the book of Revelation begin to unfold. Yes. But we are not going to be a bride that's going to stand there and go, oh, I'm so afraid. What am I going to do? We are the overcomers. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. And when we speak, creative words are going to happen. We're going to have divine authority. We're going to wear the crown upon our heads. We're going to have the authority as we declare and decree things so. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 10, verse 5, together they will be like warriors in battle, trampling their enemy into the mud of the streets. They will fight because the Lord is with them, and they will put their enemy horsemen to shame. Hallelujah. The enemy's kingdom that has wrapped himself around and entangled so many people, he is going to be driven and trampled into the mud. By the combat boots upon the bride of Christ. Yes. Hallelujah. Joel chapter 3 verse 9 proclaiming this amongst the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. That's a bride with authority. A bride that has position. A bride that knows her Lord. A bride that's married to the king. Hallelujah. Proclaim this amongst the nations. Prepare for war. He's raising up a bride that's saying, prepare yourself. Amen. Prepare yourself for war. Prepare yourself for battle. Don't be playing house of God. Don't be playing church. Don't be lukewarm. Amen. Don't be a daughter of Jerusalem, a spectator of the inner court. Be that Christ's golden queen of Psalms chapter 45. Don't be just one of the king's daughters. Be the golden queen. Hallelujah. That has this divine nature. In Jesus' name. And she will proclaim this amongst the nations. Prepare for war. And she will rally the troops in the end time. And there will be a bridal army. So when I talk about a bridal movement in the Finger Lakes, I'm not talking about getting a cute little bride together. I'm talking about getting fierce warriors that know how to intercede and pray. They are the overcomers of Revelation and they're speaking forth creative present words that are they're a tree of life that are imparting everywhere that they go in Jesus name. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever that you go. Don't be afraid. You're on the winning side. You're a warrior bride. You're not a wimpy little whimpering girl in the corner. You are a warrior bride. You have combat boots. You know how to be a lover. You know how to place your ear on the heart of Jesus. You get into the secret place. And that's my favorite aspect of the bride. That's what all of our books are about. It's all of that. But there's another aspect of the bride. When there's a battle, she knows how to fight. 
She's not going to allow the world system to come in, a Babylonian system to come in and destroy. She's not going to allow the little fox to spoil the vine. She's going to stand strong. She's going to be a tree of life. She's going to be an oak tree of righteousness, standing strong, drinking from the right water, being a pure well that others can take a drink. Thank you, Jesus. The blue jays are symbolic of the warrior bride of Christ. They're warriors of God. Warriors of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you getting anything today? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, these blue jays are known as the alarm of the forest. The alarm of the forest. For the animals and the birds of the forest, the blue jays' loud call warns them of threats. They are known as the alarms of the forest. As a result, other creatures have time to get away to safety before a predator can inflict his damage. How many creatures has this loud call saved? Only the Lord knows. So if you were to go into a forest and suddenly you heard a blue jay go, make that loud noise that it makes, that's an alarm. And all the other creatures in the forest know danger's near, predator is here, they're an alarm. And God began to speak to me that he is raising up a bride that is a spiritual alarm. And this is the word of the Lord that he gave me. For the Lord is raising up a bride who will lift up her voice into the heavens and warn the people of the forthcoming battles. They will foresee the enemy's imminent attacks and care enough to shout it from the rooftops that God will win this battle to encourage the body of Christ to stand strong and hold the line. They will sound the alarm and call the people of God to repentance and godly sorrow. Hallelujah. This bride has the voice of many waters and she is so in harmony with the Lord that she speaks with authority and with unction. Her voice is as an alarm for those that have ears to hear. Hallelujah. Hear the word of the Lord. That even as the blue jay is a an alarm in the forest. God is raising up a bride who is an alarm, a spiritual alarm. And she is shouting from the rooftops. Hallelujah. Shouting from the rooftops. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice. With a shout, lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 8. Listen, your watchmen. Lift up your voices together. They that shout for joy. When they see the Lord return to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who have let all who live in the land and tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. And he will have a bride that will blow the trumpet in Zion and warn the people, wake up, wake up, shake yourself from lukewarmness. Behold, he's standing at the door of the lukewarm heart. He's standing at the door of the lukewarm church. And he's saying, wake up. Don't be apathetic. Don't be spiritually lazy. Time is short. Prepare yourself. And so because this bride is a spiritual alarm, they are bringing literally a holy repentance to the body of Christ. There's going to be moves of God in the end times where there is literally a spirit of repentance, a holy, holy, godly sorrow for sin. And they're going to repent and get clean before God. We see this in them in the alarm of the forest. Number three, I'm going to go quickly now. They're resourceful, they're highly intelligent, and they solve problems. This special species is both practical and resourceful. They build their nests at a safe location. Where other birds, they, they're kind of like picky about where they go. They know exactly where to go. It doesn't make them... Um, weaker and makes them stronger because they know what they want and they go and they do it. They don't waste time. They solve problems very easily. They follow the best plan. 
And, and uh, one of the most amazing things about this, this bird is where it will hide nuts and seeds yeah. in thousands of different places and remembers, just like the hummingbird remembers every place that it's ever gone to get the nectar, the blue jay can remember every single place that it stored food up to thousands of locations. And people say there is no God. I don't know how you can study the Blue Jay and not see that there's a God, that there's a designer, that there's a creator to that. It's amazing. So the Lord gave me a word regarding his bride being resourceful, highly intelligent, and solving problems. Here we go. For in this, the end times, the Lord is giving his precious bride divine wisdom from on high. Did he not say, if you lack wisdom, then ask? For his bride will have the wisdom she needs to make the right choices. In fact, she will flow in such unity with her bridegroom that she will walk as he walks and do as he does and move like he moves. She will be resourceful and creative and she'll be led by the spirit and not after the flesh. Her life and identity will be guided by him alone. The secrets of the Lord will be given to her because she leans in to hear his heartbeat. The thoughts that once dragged her down will be banished by his relentless love and precious blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And she will have the mind of Christ and all that stinking thinking of the past will be washed away by his word. For even now the Lord is giving his bride increased gifting and ability to do the tasks at hand and will fulfill her, her holy calling. She will be given clever ideas and unique problem-solving abilities that will make history. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord will raise up a bride that will be resourceful. She will have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. She's not going to be forgetful and stumbling, but the Lord is giving her his mind and she's going to see things the way that he see things. She's going to have spiritual vision. First of all, she's going to have the eye of the dove. She's going to have tunnel vision, a singular focus on Jesus. And because of that, the Lord's going to trust her to see things like he sees things. And the Lord says, and I'll download her with information that she doesn't know. And revelation will come to those who ask for it. For am I not the God of all revelation? And am I not the great teacher, the Holy Spirit asks? And will I not teach my word if you ask me? And the Lord says, you can find great treasure hidden treasure amongst creation if you'll only ask for I will have a bride that has the mind of Christ that rids herself of the stinking thinking of the past that has dragged her down the old mindsets that have dragged her down in the past for I the Lord will place the helmet of salvation upon her head and I, the Lord, will lift up your shield. And I will be your shield and buckler. And I will protect you against the wiles of the enemy and the flaming darts, says the Lord. For I will have a bride. I will have a bride that has fresh strategies for war. And the Lord's giving creative power. We're called to create. We're going to create a Bible school in the Finger Lakes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Downstate, where we're, we're praying for a digging up of the wells of Setauket in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May the Lord give us clever ideas to see that happen. Witty ideas to see that happen. Let, let us meet the right people. Give us supernatural ability to know things that we don't know. That we may go everywhere that you have hidden treasure. Even like the Blue Jay knows how to go to every location, may we go to every location that you have hidden treasure for us. Because we're guided and led by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given unto you. If you lack wisdom, the Lord says, ask. Yes. Glory. Yes. Hallelujah. Jesus. Yes. 
I don't know who all our teachers at our Bible school are going to be. I don't know who's going to be the matron department. I don't know all of you, but God's going to send them from the north and the south and the east and the west. People are going to move there. People are going to come. And we're going to launch this together and see a bridal movement in the Finger Lakes like the Finger Lakes has not seen in Jesus' name. I'm praying for the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. Because Steve Porter's not smart enough. But hallelujah. His bride will have the mind of Christ. And godly discernment so that we will know what to do. What our steps are. So I'm just his little boy. Whenever I get scared and nervous, I say, Jesus, I'm your little boy. I'm your little boy, Jesus. I need my big daddy God. And that's how I feel. I'm excited about this building and, and everything that has happened, but at the same time, do you know the responsibility that I feel on me before the Lord to cultivate the ministry with integrity? And so we're dependent on the Lord. We're, we're not witty enough, creative enough, or smart enough. But He will have a blue jay. He will have a blue jay that knows where to go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And lastly, I end with this. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You How know, long Steve, have I been going? That's a kingly anointing on, you know, the blue jay represents the king. The kingly anointing. Yes. Yes. That's what we're going to have. The kingly anointing. Amen. I will see Hallelujah. the Lord. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Number four. Blue jays are curious. They're friendly, and they're attentive. When a blue jay sees a human being, he will often become curious. He takes a special interest. He takes a special interest in someone he deems special. Most of the time, he won't fear you, but will follow you here and there. Don't let this scare you, because this is his way of making you feel welcome. You might even make a new friend that will come back to visit you later. Blue Jays are curious, they're friendly, and attentive. Hear the word of the Lord that the Lord gave me regarding this. He said, for Christ's bride will be given divine interest in others that need special affirmation and care. His bride will not be self-focused, but she will be God-focused, which will then cause her to be others-focused. She will care about what God cares about, and the Lord will empower her with courage, curiosity, and bravery to go after the weary ones that need help, that need to hear a word in season, that needs to hear the Lord, that needs to hear His voice. The Lord will be so faithful and just to speak through this one. We will be the Lord's hands and feet extended. Hallelujah. She will display a godly love and compassion rather than looking out for herself. And she will not be afraid to go after the one in need. She will take the time to give individual time and attention to those who need to experience God's love. She will be led by the Spirit, for the Lord is raising up a bride that cares about what He cares about, while carrying a true heart of empathy and concern for others. These He will use as an overcoming army that will follow after God and look for needy people to love and encourage hallelujah the blue jay is curious and will follow different ones and the lord will place a curiosity amongst his bride to go after special ones and you will give them special individual attention because they need it they need they've been hurt in the past and they need some love they need some encouragement will you stop for the one that needs you hallelujah for the Lord will have a blue jay that stops for the one. That it's not just about the masses. It's about the one. The one person. And the Lord says, I will have a bride that will go after the one. She will have a divine interest, a godly compassion. And she will stop by divine appointment for the one. Zechariah chapter 7 verse 9 this is what the Lord Almighty says administer true justice show mercy and compassion to one another 
Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And lastly, James chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. For example, some, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you go stand over there or you go sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discriminate and show that your judgment are guided by evil motives? Yeah. The Lord will have a bride yes. that is not partial that loves everyone, that sees everyone like Jesus sees them. That sees everyone, that have the eyes of the Father. And that see everyone, the potential in everyone. Even the most vilest, doesn't matter how carnal and awful they are, you look with the Father's eyes and you see what they can be. And you speak into their destiny, what they not what they are, because you're not denying what they are, but you speak into their divine destiny, what they can be, and you hope. For their repentance and you hope for their restoration and you hope that they will be changed and transformed and god will use the blue jays to be curious enough curious enough to go after the one and they will and they will see healing restoration deliverance they'll see recovery and they'll see all kinds of expressions of the father's heart i'll say this one more time the lord is raising up fathers and mothers spiritual fathers and mothers that love the people that don't use their ministry as a stepping stone and could care less about the people they don't use the people for their ministry but they steward their ministry well and they care about the one they're a true father a true mother to every single person regardless of where they're at spiritually you love them and pray for them and intercede. The Lord showed me, because there were some troublemakers that I came across in my lifetime, you can imagine. And the Lord said, let me show you how I see that person. And the Lord gave me, downloaded me with a revelation of how he saw that person. And I began to understand that more. And my heart broke. And I, and through fasting and prayer, especially prayer, I prayed and sought for them for the breakthrough i had a heart to pray for them because i got that from the father that's the blue jay that's the blue jay they're curious enough they're attentive enough to see it and pray for change in jesus name so father could we not learn lessons from the blue jay we know that the blue jay is not here by accident Lord, I know that I could give some theological message, Lord, and try to break in an encyclopedia over people's heads, but Lord, I felt that you wanted me to just give a piece of my heart today and just share like a friend shares with a friend. And I ask you, Lord, that this word would impart spirit and life, that we would be trees of life and that we would be like blue jays, the trees and the birds. May we learn the spiritual lessons from them. In Jesus' precious name, amen.